Mm. Roland, what are we doing? I don't know. What the fox says? I have a bad feeling at some point all roads will lead to what the fox says. <laughs> Boys and girls, welcome to the 13 Nights of Halloween. A That Gets My Goat Marathon with Rish Outfield and Big Anklevich. Hi everybody, this is Big Anklevich. And this is Sad Rish Outfield. Sad Rish Outfield, because it was raining today. It is. Tell your joke. Okay. Everyone, If I guess you probably don't know Rish Outfield well enough to know how he feels about bad weather. But Rish Outfield is basically the opposite of Storm from the X-Men. Because Storm from the X-Men controls the weather, but the weather controls Rish. <laughs> he has the power to be depressed by bad weather <laughs> and to be happy with sunny weather. <clears throat> it's strange that there aren't more people like that. But like my friend Jeff, if it's just like miserable, gray, rainy, 11 o'clock, looks like 5 in the morning, he's just joyous. He's like, I want to live somewhere where it's like this all year round. And yeah, I just stare at, well, sharp objects, really, wanting to introduce them to my veins. Mm -hmm. So I guess there are people out there that become invigorated by gray Cold, miserable weather. Yeah, it's because those of us that are really fat, we finally feel comfortable when the weather has gotten down to where we're not sweating, sitting still. <laughs> Someday, a year from now, you'll you'll have reached that point, and then you'll understand. Okay. <laughs> Anyways, folks, we'll, we'll do um, a follow up episode then. <laughs> <laughs> we're back with another. This is the final episode of the thirteen nights. Nice. Of Halloween, is it not? I believe so. Is there any chance that these will air on time? I would think they will, but I don't know. Okay. Today should be but Halloween, therefore, right? It is. It should be October 31st, but presuming they're all edited and in the Dropbox, <laughs> will they air on time? Yeah. Okay. I will stay up all night if I have to to post them. Anyhow, I thought we had a topic for today, but I just decided to curse you instead. Okay. Curse you, sir. <laughs> the end. Did you watch the third episode of S.H.I.E.L.D. by any chance? I haven't yet, no. I did watch What Does the Fox Say, though. <laughs> <laughs> Piece of undulating crap. <laughs> yes, unfortunately, I also watched What Does the Fox Say, and I'm going to be smoking a lot more meth tonight, hoping that it clears my, my sinuses of that memory. <clears throat> now, does meth do that to you? If, if, if not, then I've been smoking the wrong thing. Clears your sinuses. Anyhow, this is the last episode of our marathon. This one seemed way easier to record than the last ones. Is it just because we prepared well in advance? Did we prepare well in advance? Well, we started o over a month ago, right? Okay, I guess you could say that, maybe. Did we start over a month ago? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think this one was easier, huh? That's interesting. Well, to just today, you said, wow, how many more of these do we have to record? Yeah, I figured we had like two or three, and you said there was only one. There's I was kind of surprised. Yeah. I think you may find as you edit through them, you'll be like, oh, crap. We still have two or three to go. <laughs> we better get back together quick. Because uh, it's the 31st. I, of course, as people know, this was all intended to get people to donate. And so this will be the last day that we can beg you. It well, won't be. We'll keep on begging until the year is out and then on into the new year. Hmm. We actually need to raise quite a lot of capital. Yeah, I was horrified <laughs> when you were just like, no, it's going to be brand new. It's going to be able to do all sorts. I got to be able to know what the funk says. I was just <laughs> horrified when you told me how much money that you needed for a new computer. It's extortion, really, folks, is what it is. And I'm passing that on to you. I'm passing that savings on to the consumer. <laughs> but I've enjoyed getting together and talking about these things. The trick, or, the really offensive trick-or-treat episode was just a delight to record. It, much like this is a delight to record. But not a delight to be in the room while it records. Mm -hmm. So uh, for the final episode, I figured we had to do something special, but nothing special is coming to mind. See, people gave us a whole list of things that they wanted us to talk about, and we only tuckle, tuckled, we only tackled, 
Is there a, a football move called a tuckle by any chance? Yeah, that's when your nuts are falling out of your jock. You tuckle them back in before you get down into your stance. I like that. <laughs> I mean, in more ways than one, I like that. Anyhow, before we tuckle, I, I, I feel bad because I asked for people to give us suggestions of what they'd like us to talk about. And there were all sorts of interesting topics, but somehow we didn't really even get to them. Which is fine. You know, we can always come back and, and do more. And uh, as ministry taught me, every day is Halloween. So I, we could do a, a scary episode in June if we wanted to. Yeah, we could do a Halloween in July if we wanted to. Can we? Did we just did we buy rights to that forever or just the one time? <laughs> how, how does that work? Can we do like a best of episode where we like re-record old stories? Or like a best of CD where we put on like five of the stories that we liked before? I mean, you, you created the contract. What did we buy it for? I mean, what term did we? I don't know. I'm sorry. But is it open-ended? Long. It might be. I don't know. Well, but but it wasn't. We want to was it definitely just? Well, there are a couple that I always like. You know, yeah. We didn't ever say that it was one time, right? I don't know. I'd have to go back and look at it. Probably not, but maybe. I don't know. Well, years and years ago, when the earth was just starting to cool, you wanted to do a radio show. And you said, oh, it would be so cool if we could get together. And we do a version of the Dune Steve that's like on the radio, where, you know, maybe we have to censor ourselves a little bit more. And we definitely have to look at the clock and say, you know, okay, well, you know, at 7.53, we got to wrap up every single time, no matter how into whatever we're talking about we are. But you also wanted to do stories on that. What did our contract with, say, Kevin David Anderson allow for us to run Halloween in July on that radio show? I, I'm sure we'd have to get in touch with whoever again to make sure that was cool. I doubt that it did because I think a radio show would be separate rights from just internet audio. I don't know. And the the Creative Commons umbrella over our show. Does that mean that we can't sell it or they can't sell it? Uh, yeah, I think it's non-sellable. For anyone. Right. But I don't know exactly how that works. Like if, if somebody's non-profit, does that count as selling it? Okay, well, um, a couple of days ago we ran my daughter's balloon. Your daughter's balloon? The daughter's balloon. Her daughter's balloon. What, what was the title of your story? I think it was my daughter's my balloon. My daughter's balloon. We made it up on the spot, so it's hard to remember for sure. We did. Uh, you know, Abby Hilton was always saying, you got to put your stuff out on Smashwords. You got to put it out there, you know, so people can buy it. People will buy it. People are really, really dumb. They will buy your stuff. No, she never said any of that. I've never met Abby Hilton, though. I'm sure she's charming. <laughs> but let's say that you say, hey, I'm going to put my daughter's balloon on Smashwords. The fact that we put it out for free under a Creative Commons license, that's the word I was looking for, that in no way prevents you from selling it on Smashwords, right? As, I mean, you own it, yeah. right? Yeah, the Creative Commons just applies to the audio production of it, that particular audio production of it even. We could make another audio production of it and sell that. I could even take that and release it in a, an, under a non-Creative Commons and sell it on something. The exact same recording that you and I did in this room, you could put on audible.com for a fee. Mm-hmm. See, that's interesting because uh, the guy that you used to really like, Dean Wesley Smith, used to talk about doing stuff like that. Sell it and then sell it again and sell it and sell it and sell it again. Mm-hmm. It was a rap song. There's a bazillion and, different kind of rights that you can sell a story for. You can sell foreign language rights and you can sell et cetera, et cetera. But just because it's out there for free once doesn't mean it's always going to be <sighs> – do you know what I'm getting at? Because mm-hmm. I, I would like you to put my daughter's balloon out there and say, hey, buy this. I wrote this. Buy it. Enjoy. But we presented it for the very first time this week on our show for free. It, that doesn't matter in any way? No, I don't think so. It's just like you have your story on Amazon and you put it available for free for a week. And then now the week is over and it costs $3 or something. It was free, but it's not – it doesn't always have to be free. It's not like it's 
in cement or something. Since it's the last day, I, yeah, I wanted to do something special. And as you've heard, if you listened for the last 20 minutes, I couldn't come up with anything. Nobody listened to the last 20 minutes because you excised it to save them. That's true. That's how much I like our listeners. Luckily, we still have listeners because had they listened to the last 20 minutes, they would all be dead at their own hands. Yeah, see what you did there? I, I did actually go through on Dusty Wings and change all the things that I didn't like yeah. in our post episode. And so that version on Smash Words is me fixing the plot holes. Oh, cool. So it's the new and improved version then. But the lesson that can be learned from it, we've been doing the show for six years now. We've been saying it for six years. Always read your story aloud before you give it to somebody. I had never read on Dusty Wings aloud. And what, hearing you read it, suddenly all the problems came to the surface. And, that, and, and just anybody out there, if you're a writer, even if you're a fantastic writer who's been writing for 30 years, read it aloud. Honestly, you'll catch things that are totally fine in silence that don't work aloud. That's just my little bit of advice from your Uncle Rish. There you go. Yeah, I think we came across a few problems in my story, too, where it needed to be, had it been read aloud, we would have fixed them. And, of course, we did fix them when we read aloud. We're like, what? Well, you can't say this. And so we changed it. Well, the only one I remember was that there was a character uh, right. who had two different names. But, again, until you read it aloud, you're just like, oh, hey, those, this isn't the same name. You read it silently to yourself, and your brain is just going to fix it. Yeah, the but, funny thing was we didn't even catch it. No. The first time reading it aloud either, we caught it later when we started talking about it. Well, wait a minute. There was a third person in there that – how can that be? There wasn't a third person. You have four children. Mm -hmm. When we were talking about my daughter's balloon, I kept referring to your three children. And I think you never once corrected me. Do you sometimes forget that you have a fourth kid and it's three <laughs> kids? Because you had three kids for so long. I don't forget that. Oh, okay. It's just, you know, there's, they're kind of a separate because the three older ones are so much older than the one. So, you know, it's easy to say, yeah, these three. But the character that is you in her daughter's balloons, her, thy daughter's balloons, <laughs> has the, only three kids. Uh-huh. Was that purposely changed from the four kids that you actually have? Or is it just like, well, for the story, he's got three kids because I usually have three kids. Yeah, it was just there was no only need for three kids. And there was, you know, that was fine. There was no baby to be involved in. You know what I mean? Oh, there was no point to have the baby right. in the story. There just was no point. need for it. And it didn't have to be exactly autobiographical. I mean, I'm sure it was to a fair amount. But it wasn't, you know what I mean? Yes, I had a creepy balloon that lurked in my house, which gave me the idea, but it wasn't supposed to actually be me. Okay. I just thought that that was an interesting point. Yeah. I do have a tendency to write a little too autobiographical, I think, when I write stories often. So sometimes I try to make differences and stuff like that. No, and that's admirable. I, I think we both talked about that, that you said once – that I tend to always have like some kind of loser that's on the outside, that's a geek, that's into nerdy things and maybe bad with women in my stories. And I thought about that and I thought, wow, I do do that a lot. Shoot, man. Does that make me a crappy writer? And we were just having that conversation today of what, what, what makes me a crappy writer and, and my worry of, you know, hey, I've written about this subject before. Does that make me a crappy writer? You know, that's something that comes up over and over again whenever I realize that I touch on the same themes or I have the same ending pop up in multiple stories. And yeah, it's something that I've carried with me for years because I, you know, I don't know if I'm a good writer or not, but just the last couple of days I've been listening to Neil Gaiman's newest book. I believe it's called The Ocean at the End of the Block. Does that sound right? Okay, I'll go with it. Oh, you don't know? I don't, but I'll go with it. And yeah, it bothers Abby that I don't say the name of the book I'm reading. So there you go. That's for you. <laughs> I got the name wrong, I'm sure, but it was written by Neil Gaiman and it's new. And it's yet another one of those stories where there are ancient beings and gods among us in human form that have always been here, that have all sorts of magic and po powers and a connection to the earth that we can't understand. And then they encounter a mortal who has their eyes opened to how the world. The ocean at the end of the lane 
It's called. Oh, my. Okay, well, forget everything I said. This book sucks. When it was called The Ocean at the End of the Block, I could let it go. But anyway, discovering that Neil Gaiman has written about this same subject over and over and over and over, it's so weird. It made everything all right. It was San Salieri, the patron saint of mediocrity, saying, Ti absolvo, which is what I long to hear on my deathbed. The truth is there are things that I, I'm afraid of, things that I'm fascinated by, questions that I have that don't get answered, and I go to them again and again and again. It's like a bottomless sack of inspiration. You know what I mean? I like a bottomless fountain drink, kind of like that. Who wrote about a bottomless fountain drink? Nobody. Ever. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a huge void to be filled, folks. If you want to be the one that writes about the bottomless fountain drink, I will buy your story. Not for the dune, Steve, but I will buy it. For 99 cents. <laughs> yeah. In the bargain bin. And so, okay, so it's the last day of our marathon. And there are things that I go to again and again that I'm afraid of. You all know that I'm afraid of children. And I've told the story of going into my room and there being a kid in there that I didn't know. He was there for a, a Super Bowl party, but he happened to be in my room. And uh, and it, it didn't frighten me, but it was just like, oh, it startled me. Mm -hmm. And uh, my nephew has done that a couple of times where I've been in the bathroom, in the shower or on the toilet or whatever. And I come into my room and there he is. And it's frightened me. And he, he laughs that a child could scare an adult. But... You know me. Anything can scare me. I'm not exactly an adult. Uh, another thing that I go back to again and again and again, and you can probably pick these out too because you've read some of my stories, but creatures that appear to be human beings but are not. They are masquerading as human beings. They're passing as human beings. For some reason, that fascinates the hell out of me, the, the idea of that. You know, you think it's your friend, but it's not your friend. It's something else. I will probably never stop writing stories about that because it just, it lights my imagination on fire. And then one other scary thing uh, that goes, it, go, it goes hand in hand with the Neil Gaiman book that I'm reading right now is thinking that you know how the world works, that you know the, the rules that are set up, and then discovering that you are wrong that there's something that flies in the face of that you know what i'm saying that i've lived long enough to know that that how the world works except in this case it doesn't work that way that's kind of something that's happening in this book and it, you know it happens a lot with what is that subgenre magical magical realism, realism? Yeah. Where everything's real except for the one thing that's magical or something like that. Do you really know or are you just saying that? I, I've heard the term and so forth. That's a subject for another time, but I hate all of that stuff. I hate all of those. This is this and that is that. Seagull. seagull. Uh-huh. You just hate seagulls. Yeah. What's I your do. deal they're, with they're, seagulls? They're, they're the rats of the, of the ocean, of the beach, yeah. of California, of Minnesota, Utah, of... Of Guam, really. They do like junkyards. And rats do too. I yeah. Think, I think, think rats and uh, seagulls would, would get along mm -hmm. in hell. You and I have lived for a few years long enough for me not to get the mentality of the generations below us, not to get the things that entertain kids nowadays. And so, again, with years comes a an arrogance a, a, a sense of pride that I know how the world works. I've been around the block a few times, and this is this, and that is that. It's not Seagull. your first rodeo? It's not. I've been to several rodeos. I grew up in a farmland community where once a year it was rodeo time. <clears throat> That's how we caught livestock. <laughs> you could, they, there were greased up pigs and uh, and chickens, and, and I caught a duck one time. And my dad's like, what are we going to do with a duck? So I gave it to cousins or something like that. So, you know, I think I know how the world works. You said, we're going to start a dynasty with it, Dad. <laughs> Talking about things that, from, that the younger generation really eats up that I don't get. But every once in a while, something will happen and, I, and I, I can't explain it. I don't like 
to be confused. I don't like to to not know what the fox says. <laughs> And this is a story I, I think I told you once, but I've never told it on the air. It's it's a really, uh, I'm going to use the word intimate story, even though that's not the best word for it. It's a story that I don't want to share with a lot of people because it it's it bothers me. My uncle has a daughter and he has claimed, this is the same uncle that sees his dead mother once a month in dreams. He has claimed that she has some kind of Abilities. I'm putting my hands in the air. She, she knows things that she can't know. She sees things that she shouldn't be able to see. And suddenly she has an intellect way, way above the intellect that she was born with. And she advises him on like the lawsuits that he's preparing, the paperwork that he's doing and all this stuff as like a six-year-old kid with Down syndrome. So again, I don't believe these stories. I think, oh, you love your daughter and you're overcompensating and that's good. Usually when he tells these stories, I'm like, oh, yeah, tell your stories. Go, you go, girl. Because I don't believe him. I just enjoy the way he tells stories. He, He says that his daughter has some kind of superior talents in some way that we can't put our finger on. It's kind of like how Storm controls the weather or how the weather controls you kind of a thing. Yeah. And I see, I love the X-Men and I love comic books and superheroes and all that stuff, but I know that stuff's not real. But we went to a eating establishment one time with him and his daughter. And I think my mom was there and some people came into the restaurant and his daughter saw them and she started to talk. She was just babbling and John lit up. And he's like, she's doing it. She's doing it, you guys. And she said, that that family's name is the Jenkins. That's Robert. That's Alex. That's Donetta. That's Jane. They're from Utland Heights, Louisiana. He was born in 1947 or whatever. And he's just like, oh, isn't this the greatest thing? And I froze up. I, I saw something going on here that I did not want to see. I wanted to stand and get the F out of there. And John says, what's the, what's the matter? Dude, I guarantee you these things that she's saying are true. Let's go over there to that family. We'll ask what everybody's name is. We'll ask where they're from. We'll ask where they're born. We'll ask, and I, I, said, I, I said, no. No. I, I would have given anything to have this stop. I was terrified of the thought of going over there and having him say, this is my wife, Donetta. My name is Andrew. You know, we're all from Louisiana, our town. The thought that this child could somehow know these things opened up a door to my perception of how the world works that had never been there before. And I didn't want to have anything to do with this door. Um, Now, I don't know if that makes me alone in the world, if anybody else would be like, that's the coolest carnival trick I've ever seen. Well, I would pay to be in a room with that kid. Yeah, I don't want to go to that carnival. I want to know that A plus B equals C. That I, I know how the world works, that I know the rules, and that these rules are set in stone, that there's science governing things. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Now, is, is, okay, give me your thoughts. Have you heard me tell this story before? No, I don't think I so. I think you're the only the second person I've ever told it because I was surprised by it. And when uh, my uncle found out that I did not dig this trick that his kid could do, he, he just didn't get it. He's just like, don't you understand? She's special. You know what I mean? Okay, can you relate to, to, to this at all? Have you ever had any anything similar happened to you well there was this time when i was younger and i went to the pool and i was able to communicate with the fish and it turns out that made me special too now why were there fish in a pool like a public pool kind of thing shoot that really blows my story doesn't it (laughs) sorry um i went to the sea world yeah, I don't know that I would be terrified. Maybe I would be terrified. I, I I know that there's been times in my life where I hear something and I'm just like, oh. 
you hear a story or you've actually oh, some somebody does something or you know something weird and you're just like whoa this isn't real kind of a thing you know somebody knows and they're effing with you or something like that kind of a thing is what i hope it is because yeah it is it is some something that definitely can scare you i guess when it comes down to it you you when you started up with this were you saying that this is something that you explore often in your stories or is it just something that you're no this is a fear that i have and i have written stories i the, the overtaken is a good one where this husband and wife they move to a little town i love that story and they the find way. out I I told you that on one day <laughs> october 13th every year something happens to people in this town they, that's takeover day in this little town of tracy arizona it doesn't happen to everybody but some people are selected and i'm making quotes in the air to have a visitor come into their body and control them for a little while just the idea of you know my my wife and i are adults we know how the world works we've moved into this town immediately they disbelieve immediately this is a joke this is a prank they pull on anybody that moves into the town and it's like wow this is an elaborate prank because everybody on the block is in on it kind of thing until you get to the point where you can't refute it it is actually happening it happens to uh the wife. happens to the wife and the guy that describes this to them is like, welcome to the neighborhood. This is takeover day, folks. He's not saying this is a terrible thing about the town. He's saying this is a really neat thing about Tracy, Arizona. Yeah, so so that story is, I mean, it's about other things. But I like the idea that on one day of the year or there's a place you can go where the rules just don't apply or the rules are tweaked. A little bit kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that I write about again and again and again. But just, yeah, the the idea of – and this is a, one of the subjects we talked about last year of would it be worse to go crazy and not realize it or everybody thinks you're crazy but you're sure you're not. And I, I think the latter is much scarier. People are saying that you're crazy and you're like, no, I, I see what I see or I, I'm thinking reasonable. I haven't changed at all. You guys are the ones who have changed and all that, all that kind of stuff really scares me. I, I will have dreams and I don't know, maybe this should be an episode about dreams, but I've just talked too damn much. But I, I have dreams all the time where everybody is speaking a foreign language or I don't know how I got there. I'm someplace and everybody just accepts that I'm supposed to be there, but I don't know how I got there or why I'm there. And I don't dare tell people that I don't belong or, you or know, but you're in your underwear. It, yes, you're, and... you're naked in church. It's one of those <laughs> dreams and it happens a lot. It's different variations on that same theme. But again, it's the rules don't apply all of a sudden. But to everybody else, this is normal. And that's just terrifying to me. I don't know. I, I Maybe I that was an overshare, the uncle thing. Because somebody who listened to that says he just made up that whole story. I know There ain't did. no girl like that. Exactly. John Cougar Mellencamp somewhere is just saying whatever the next line in the song <laughs> is. But I, I, I promise you this is a true story. And I guess she does it all the time. And he's just like so proud of what his daughter can do. But yeah, if I could flush that memory from my mind, I would love his kid a lot more. I'm kind of afraid of his kid because of that. And I've only seen her do it once. The rest of the time, she's a nice word for out of it. Um, she's She doesn't participate in conversations. She doesn't mm -hmm. communicate on a, the same level as, as, as regular people. Am, am I saying offensive things? I don't know. I'm not, I'm not trying to. I'm just saying she's not average. Anyway, that doesn't matter. I, I, I And I don't mean to displease people that say, you know, somebody with mental handicaps or whatever are just the same as everybody else. In this case, she's not. She's just, she's just not the same as everybody else. In this way, apparently she's extraordinary. But uh, I love that in my entertainment. In real life, I don't have anything to do with it. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a kind of a thing that has gone on a lot in literature forever. You know, the the kind of you wake up and something's changed in the world. I mean, you go back to like Kafka's metamorphosis kind of a thing. Guy wakes up and he's a bug one day and life goes on from there. 
he knew what the world was like when he went to sleep, but it's changed. And he likes it, which is always the, uh, the I think, the That's interesting the part about that story. Turns out he wants to be a bug. The ghosts episode, you said that you have a friend or your wife has a friend who all of a sudden started talking about, we had to move because my kid had a problem with ghosts. Mm-hmm. And that your wife referred to this person as a freak because of it. Is there any allowance in your mind for the possibility that the house really does have ghosts? I don't know. It was a new house. They were the only family that had ever lived in it. I don't know if that means anything. If that's how ghosts, you know, maybe go. I don't don't know. But were you in the room when she told this story? No, I wasn't. So I wasn't around to get the chills or the tingles or any feel my nuts drop or whatever it is that you feel when when you hear something that makes you scared but yeah i i don't know it's hard to say like ghosts in fiction anyways tend to usually have some kind of a reason for being there kind of a thing it's like you you mentioned in the ghost episode i believe mama wasn't it the movie that you saw where the ghost was scary but then they gave it a backstory and then you're like oh it's just a sad ghost oh so sweet but <laughs> you know they always have some kind of like oh they were wronged when they were alive or they maybe they built their house on an indian burial ground or something and that's where they but i don't know it seems like usually ghosts are in old houses not in brand new ones when people say they have ghosts anyways i don't know that's May well be the only person I know who's ever claimed that there was a ghost in their house. So, Well, if you had been in the room when she told this story, that I guess she told your wife, would you have looked at the woman differently? Would you have called her a freak? Or would you have paused for a moment and thought, I wonder if they really did have a ghost in their house. So it, do, do you have a fear of somebody screwing with your perception of reality the same way that I do? I do, definitely. I don't know if it's one of those fears that comes up a lot, you know what I mean? Because I'm old and I know how things work. Like, you are old and you know how things work. So something has to contradict that for me. Maybe I would be like, whoa, wait, ghosts are real. Or, you know, I don't know what it would take to make me feel that way, though, you know what I mean? Like, would I feel that just from somebody telling me a story? Like you said, your uncle has told you these stories for a long time. But you always dismissed them until you actually saw her doing it. And then all of a sudden you were confronted with it and more, much more scared by it than before. Before you could always just brush it off and say, just my uncle making up his stupid stories that he always makes up. Um, well, he, he has one of those personalities. Like, okay, well, I worked on Boston Legal with a certain Shatnerian actor. And when he was on the set, everybody knew. William Shatner was on the set. He was so larger than life and so look at me, everyone gravitate toward me. Did you see what I just did? Kind of thing. And I know I tell that story a lot. I love William Shatner, but it was weird to see him want the adulation and the attention. And my uncle is just like that. You know, he's super outspoken, super outgoing, super fearless. You know, he doesn't care if he offends somebody or whatever he wants, but he wants the spotlight on himself. And so the things that he said, I take with a grain of salt. You know what I mean? He's told stories about seeing things that nobody else has ever seen. You're like, yeah, that's a cool story. I I, I don't 100% believe the story, but he's a good storyteller. And and like when I tell you a story and then you, it turns out to not be entirely true. uh, Hopefully you're not like, oh, that a-hole. He misdescribed the pilot episode of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., because he's an a-hole. Rather, you just go, well, he did it again. He <laughs> described a scene in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. that didn't happen in it because somehow he thought that I would like it better if I talked about full frontal nudity in the third act. And so that's kind of how I am with him, you know. But then to actually see one of his stories come true, I could no longer take things with a grain of salt. Right, right. So that's what I was saying that, you know, this is the same kind of thing. Just hearing... This woman tell her story about the ghost would basically be the same thing where I could just, oh, here's some salt. Let me take a grain of it. There we go. Kind of a thing. Whereas being at her house when 
I walk across a cold spot and then the door slams behind me or something like that. I don't know what. And then I go, wait, uh, what? Did you hear that? Was it? Oh, it was nothing. You know, <laughs> like an episode of Ghost Hunters or something, you know, maybe that would be something that would make me feel that way. I'm not sure there's been times where I've come across that kind of a thing. I'm trying to think of a, one of them that kind of makes me wonder. Okay, well, your son has left stuff all over the floor for some reason. I'm not judging your son because I do the same thing. Let's say that you got after him. And you made him put it all away, and he goes up t- to his room and goes to bed, and you come downstairs, and the stuff is all over the floor again. And you're like, why did you do it? Okay, you know what? I know it's 3 in the morning. You get down there and clean it up. And he's like, Dad, I didn't. I did not do that. Would that be enough for you to be like, maybe something else did that? Or would your mind say, I know how things work. Either you did it or you did it in your sleep, but it was you. I don't know. I'm not sure where what it would take to tell you the truth, but that could be something. The stuff is all over the floor. I'm pretty sure because he'll forget it when he goes to school tomorrow if it's not. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's basically he has to trip over to get out the door and therefore it's on the floor. But uh, I'm not sure what it would take to change my perception to make me think, oh, maybe there is something else. I mean, there's lots of things that I would, I, you know, I see them on TV shows, movies, etc. That if something like that actually happened to me, that might do it. And there are times where I'm I hear a noise at night or something like that to the point where I'm like, "What is that?" The other night, <laughs> that was happening where there's this weird noise going on in the house, and my wife's just like, "What is that noise?" You know, she's half asleep because it's late at night, and she's like, "What is that noise?" And I'm like, "I think it's just like water dripping off the roof and landing on something." It sounded like maybe there was a bucket upside down and drips were dropping from very high and landing on it, making a good thump kind of a noise. Up right above you? You couldn't quite pinpoint it. You know how it is with sounds sometimes where you're just like, that could be, couldn't, I, could, I thought it was from outside though, but it kept happening and she kept going, oh, what is that? What is, yeah, that's not water. That can't be water. And she just kept, I don't know what it was that was so upsetting about it to her, but she kept asking me to define this thing for her for some reason. So it kept going on. Finally, I got up and I went to listen to it and it sounded like it was coming from the baby's room. So I went into the baby's room and I could hear it, but it was actually on the wall that I was hearing it. And I realized, no, it's coming from my daughter's room, which is on the other side of that wall. So I went around to the other room and I went in there. Her bed was up against the wall too close so that the post of it, every time she would roll a little bit, it would rub against the baseboard of the wall and make this noise. I finally figured it out. But yeah, it's one of those things where until you figure it out, you're just like, what the heck well, at, is at, making this noise? At any point, was it something awful? Was it something, uh-oh, what if kind of thing? Or was there always a, well, there's got to be an explanation. There's pipes. There's electronics in the house. There, there's, there's a storm in, outside. Intruders there's, in the house. Well, was that one of your options? Guns. Those are always one of the options that I come up with. Not usually ghosts. That's not usually something that I will jump to. But we live in the world where, you know, people get kidnapped out of their house kind of a thing is always the, the boogeyman that you, you go to. Your children being taken by some psychopath serial killer. And that's more likely than some being right. in there wanting to be your daughter, which is, of course, where my mind would go. <laughs> One other silly tangent that reminded me, you know, what your wife saying, hey, fix that kind of thing. You used to tell me, you used to regale me. With stories of things that your wife said while she was half asleep. <laughs> I, and that fascinated me. Just the uh, idea of her saying something and only you know she said it. She doesn't even know she said it. In the morning, she will have no memory of saying it. And what if she said something that she couldn't possibly know or that doesn't come from her? And I, I wrote a story about that and I, I hoped that you would too. But That actually happened where she said something that was... She like said something in the middle of the night and then didn't remember it in the morning, but it turned out to be true. Like one night I was there and she's thrashing around and she goes, Rich's new story sucks. She couldn't know that because she hadn't read ever read any of your stories, but it turns out. All right. Well, okay. (laughs) A very Uh... crappy door was opened to a world that you didn't (laughs) want to. Now I can't remember what I was going to (laughs) say. I threw you for a loop. 
Actually, I'm what sorry. were we talking about? We were talking about my wife having saying strange things in the middle of the night, and that you wanted me to write a story about it too. I think. And okay, this is a stupid story that that goes nowhere. But my first year of college, my f- two best friends and I were all going to school at the same community college, and we were going to carpool one time, or sometimes we carpooled. I mean, most of the time it was never because we were young and wanted to do our own thing. But we had talked about carpooling, my friend Rhett and I, and I was going to go pick him up the next morning so that we could go to school together. And he, I got a call late at night. It was like quarter to 12 or something like that. And my parents were, you know, who, who calls at this hour? And it was Rhett. And he said, I can't go to school with you tomorrow or don't pick me up tomorrow. And then he said some weird thing. And I I wrote it down in my journal at the time, but I can't remember what it was. <laughs> but it was nonsense. It was like sleep talk kind of thing. Mm-hmm. It's a good biscuit, but <laughs> only with real butter, the margarine doesn't make its taste come to the surface. And I was like, what? Hey, Rhett, what, what was that? What did you say? Is that from something? And he's like, hey, I got to go. And he hung up. And so I was just like... It was the weirdest thing. I mean, he's got a sense of humor I just don't understand. So I went to school by myself the next day or whatever, and that afternoon I got a call from Rhett. And he's like, hey, I waited for you to come pick me up. I finally just had to go on my own, but I you know, I was 15 minutes late. What happened? Couldn't you give me a call and let me know you weren't coming? And I was just like, dude, you called last night and told me not to come pick you up. And he's like, no, I didn't. And I said, Rhett, yes, you did. You called last night and you said some shit about it being a good biscuit, but with real butter, but not margarine. And he's like, okay, now I know that you're joking with me. Look, I I had to be at school at a certain time today. Next time you say you're going to be somewhere. And I, I, I thought, I, I'm not getting angry at him. I'm waiting for him to say, <laughs> ha, ha, ha. He never did. He never caught to it. It's all these years later. It's still one of those stories. Mm -hmm. And telling it to you now, 20 years later, I think the guy was half asleep and he had no memory of it or whatever. He sleep dialed you? But immediately after, I mean, my- Or drunk dialed you, maybe. My my mind went in all sorts of directions. It's like, I, I, what was it? Who was it that I spoke to that pretended to be wreck kind of thing? And, And so I came up with this whole scenario of if I had gone to pick him up, we both would have been in a car accident. We both would have died. And so some- angel or being or somebody from another dimension wanted to prevent this disaster and so they pretended to be him and they called it off and it pissed him off a little bit but it saved our lives it made for a hell of a story but i mean it made for a a a a hell of a incorporating it into a story didn't make for a hell of a story just telling you this now (laughs) you're just like why why are we still talking (laughs) but again it's one of those where i was young enough and i didn't know how the world worked or whatever If that happened to me now, I think I would have a much stronger, more visceral reaction. And I think the punchline would be, I would not talk to Red anymore. He and I would be done uh, because I don't want to be around that. I don't want to constantly think about that. I would become angry at him or angry at myself for believing, or I'd start to question, maybe I dreamt that. Maybe it was a really vivid dream kind of thing. I would come up with any excuse to disbelieve because I don't want the status quo to be messed with. Because the status is not quo. The world is a mess and I need to rule it. Rule it, that's right. <laughs> but it reminded me of your wi- your conversations with your, your one-sided conversation. <laughs> your one-sided, two-sided conversations with your wife, <laughs> uh, which fascinates me. I think it's really, really neat. And I mean, have you ever been able to use that to your advantage and been like, hey, honey, what did you get me for, for my birthday? She's like, I oh, got you a book by Raymond Feist. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. It's not good enough. You need to give me something else. Okay. <laughs> kind of thing. Can you use it to your advantage or is uh, it just? See, I don't think so. It's weird. It's hard to know when she's going to remember it and not going to remember it. You know oh, what sometimes I mean? she does. Sometimes she will remember it because she wakes up and tries to tell me things. At night, I'll, oh, yeah, the kids have this in the fridge for breakfast. I've got it for them. And make sure that takes his trumpet to school so that he doesn't get in trouble. 
I put it on the floor in front of the door so he has to trip over it on his way out. I don't know. She'll she'll do that kind of stuff. But it's completely coherent or there's mumbling in there? I mean, what it's, you just described, is that is that accurate or would it be like, and then the trumpet has... It's a usually on. pretty uh, coherent when she's... But when she says stuff that she doesn't remember, it's also really co- coherent too. She'll wake up and she she does the same thing a thousand times where she wakes up and then she'll be like, come over here and talk to me. We never talk. How come you don't want to talk with me? And she says this a thousand times. And I'm sure it's because... <laughs> Wait, what? She's oh, oh eh, like every third night of the week, she wakes up and says this to me when I'm like getting into bed. And I think it has to do with the fact that She's working a different schedule than me. And so in reality, we probably don't talk as much as we should or to keep our relationship working or whatever. So it's probably a fear. Maybe that's the fear that she has. that The world isn't working like she wants it to. And so it's always something she thinks about in the middle of the night or whatever when she wakes up. But, but that's how I know, she, for one, when she starts something out like that, it's okay. She's not going to remember this. She's totally asleep. And so she'll say this to me and I say, why don't you just go back to sleep? <laughs> that's usually how I respond. Do you ever indulge the ghost her, though? I mean, just say, <laughs> all right. Or, I mean, have you ever played with this? Said like nonsense to her to see if she reacts or <laughs> said something to her that you would never say to her awake you know what i mean i should i i don't think i mess with her enough because yeah i mean she does it a lot it's like but the things that she says to you are all her inhibitions gone when she's in this semi-sleeping state and she says things to you that she would not say if she were 100 percent awake i don't think it's that kind of a thing she just says the same thing that she'll say over and over and over again that's the weird thing is that she'll wake up she's like Let's talk. And it's like, you've been asleep for three hours and you like have maybe three hours more left of sleep and you want to just talk. But like she right is now? sleeping though, right? Basically. I mean, she's, she may be awake, but not awake. You know how you wake up a little bit enough to like interact even, but not enough to really remember it or anything like that. You just lay back down and you'll go right back to sleep. She's awake, but she's not with it. It's kind of like that. I don't think she's asleep when she says this stuff. She's awake. She's just not awake enough that, you know, she's going to remember. And there's lots of times where I'll tell her stuff that she said the next morning and she'll just laugh. But she believes you. Does well, she, has she ever not believed you? No, she knows by now how much she does this. And so, yeah, she just, she'll laugh about it. Oh, gosh, is that what I, uh, kind of a thing. But this doesn't go the other way. You've never had a conversation with her that you can't remember the next one. I'm sure I've done it a time or two. I think she's mentioned it to me where I'm not totally awake. She'll wake me up enough that I'll say something. I'll try and say something and it doesn't make any sense. And I think anybody will do that if you wake them up enough to get them out of sleep but not really get them out of sleep kind of a thing. Like I remember one time when I was a kid, I walked into my bedroom and I had to share this bedroom with my older brother and my older brother wakes up and goes, hey, make sure you put the dime in the glove box because I'm taking Janine out for a day tonight. And I'm just like, what? And then he goes, oh, nothing. Forget it. And then he goes back to sleep. I think he'd realized when I stopped and said, what? <laughs> that he was just mumbling nonsense. Sometimes I think it might, the, the real nonsense stuff might be stuff that, is part of your dream or your dream, you know, somehow involved with whatever you were dreaming with. So your mind is still thinking about whatever wacky thing you were dreaming of because dreams can be awful wacky. I think it's something that anybody can do if you just get them right. And I know that I've done it where I say stuff that doesn't quite make sense. Or I know that I've done this where she wakes me up and she asks me a question or something and I'm, I know the answer and I'm trying to say it, but I can't get my wits together enough to actually make any sense. And so I'm like, it's the blood, and I'll say words that don't go together, and she'll just laugh at me. But does that doesn't happen very often to me, whereas to her, <laughs> it happens a lot. Is it because you are a deeper sleeper? Or what it was? I think so. That's definitely the case because I know that she sleeps much lighter than I do. Like she was talking about in the new house, there's an area in the upstairs hallway that creaks. There's boards 
that creak every time you walk. And she's like, oh, this will be good. When the kids get a little older, they won't be able to sneak out because I'll hear this. I'm like, you'll hear this when you're asleep? And she's like, you don't understand how light of a sleeper I am. Yeah, I'll hear it. She's like, wow, mouse farts. And you'll be like, what was that? Well, since you've moved into this house, have we wakened her ever doing our recordings? Oh, I'm sure we have. Because we used to be just right next to her. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I'm um, sure we still do, though. Because there's not, like, there's no wall out of this room, or no door, I should say, to, to seal up this room, which would make a huge difference. But yeah, I'm sure our voices just go right up the stairs and right in the door. She can't sleep with the door shut. She just can't deal with She doesn't like that. It makes her feel like something can happen, I guess, that she wouldn't hear or something it's like that. It's not claustrophobia. It's something no. is cutting me off from my children. Yeah, I think it's more like that. She wants to be able to know if there's something going on or whatever. Either the kid's still causing trouble or something tr- trying to cause trouble to the kids or something is like that. Is this just in the new house? or No, I think it was she would always been that way. As well. Not old, but last house. On the left... Lane with the ocean. Ah, I meant for this episode to go in a different way, but it went where it went, folks. Yeah, our episodes are like unruly fictional characters that suddenly take the story in some other direction. It's funny because I don't write that way at all. (laughs) No, I don't either. And I mean, there have been times when I have changed my mind, but I never feel like the characters surprise me or change change my mind he wanted to live (laughs) kind of thing it's just a a subject for another time i guess and i think that that's one of the reasons that in yesterday's story i made the guy kind of a douche it's because i knew what was going to happen to him and i didn't want to feel a lot of sympathy for this guy even though nobody wants that to happen to themselves (laughs) anyway so this the episode went where it went is is there anything else we want to say or should we just call it the bears are who we thought they were Wait, wait. What sound does the bear make? (laughs) (laughs) All right. So I guess that's it, huh? I think so. That's our marathon limping across the finish line. Well, is there a better way to end it? Should we have... End strong. Sprint across the finish line. Was there any fear you wanted to talk about? I, I, I guess... All this episode was me talking about my fear of somebody saying, hey, the world isn't how you think it is. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we're going to end it now. I'm going to end it now, whether you want to or not. I'm just going to say goodbye and turn it off. Okay, but uh, in the middle of your tangent. 20 minutes ago, (laughs) I was gearing up to asking people to donate. Oh, okay. Um, I'll let you do that. Okay, folks, we really need the money right now because of Big's terrible... And ridiculously overpriced. No, okay, computer. sorry. Uh, time's up. I mean, it's Time almost insulting go. when he told me how much money. I'm Big Anklevich. He's just and it's so self indulgent. It is. It's it's embarrassing, really, to find out how thanks much money for listening to. What's this one called? That gets my goat. Really? That gets my goat on the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. It's published under a Creative Commons Attribution, Non Commercial, No Derivatives License. This means that you may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them. If you're ever in a generous mood, or even if you're not, we'd love it if you donate. Just press the button on the website to donate $5 a month, a quarter, or choose your own one-time donation amount. Somebody saying, hey, the world isn't how you think it is. Um, is but there... the bears are who we thought they were. What is this? <laughs> what is it you're saying? What is, I, obviously, this is a song. No, it's not. <laughs> it's the Coors ads is what they were for, where they took post-game comments from coaches, and then they would change it around. So, like, they had these dudes that, like, loved Coors or whatever, and they would ask the coach. They'd be in the press conference. They'd be like, oh, coach, coach. We love the new Coors can or whatever. What do you think or something like that? And, the and coach, then they cut to actual coach The actual response. coach from an actual press conference saying something. This coach, Dennis Green. It was a weird thing. Like the Bears were a good team that year. They were undefeated. Dennis Green was the coach of the Arizona Cardinals. They played each other. And the Arizona Cardinals, which weren't a good team, almost won. But they blew it at the end like with something stupid. So he goes into the press conference afterwards 
And he starts yelling about how the bears are who we thought they were. And we let him off the hook. They are who we thought they were. It's just, it, it was like a confusing thing. And that was the deal with the commercial. They're like, they are who you thought they were. They are who we thought they were. Uh, I don't understand what you're talking about, coach. <laughs> or whatever. Well, and then they're like, hey, those guys just took your Coors. And then he just turns and walks off. It was just one of those weird, like, the coach is losing it kind of moments. 